Hello guys and welcome to Phil's Fitness Show and today I've got the unbelievable John Charles and what we're going to be talking about today is how he used his hobbies with painting and with the gym to help him recover from his past problems. So it's going to be a fantastic interview so make sure you tune in and listen up. Welcome John, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm super excited yeah, yeah. to have you here. Thanks for having me on. I just want to talk about, obviously you being my client first for about, probably about two years now, aren't you? Could be longer, yeah, I reckon. Maybe been more than two years. Yeah. But when you come on board, obviously you're a bit out of shape as well, but you transformed drastically. And I've got to be honest, I think you won the best transformations, especially in six weeks. It's ridiculous. That I've ever had. Still people don't believe it. And people don't believe it. Six nah. weeks, I've had I've, I've people questioning me before, saying yeah. that did not happen in six weeks. What are you playing at? No, but I've, seen, I've seen stuff like that before, and I've questioned it myself, but then when I was first and the person, I was like, man, that's mental, that. Yeah. You look back now and think that's crazy. It was that's ab- absolutely crazy, wasn't it? But for yourself, when we first spoke, I didn't know too much about your history because I've got a lot of clients now, and I think especially in Liverpool, yeah. drugs and alcohol problems, they are rife. Yeah. Rife. It just takes over people's lives. It's absolute destruction for certain people as yeah. well, isn't it? But for yourself, I didn't know this about you initially because we didn't really talk about it. We were obviously clients and now we're really, really close friends. But it was a bit of a problem for yourself, wasn't it? Yeah, massive. It wasn't even a bit of a problem. It was it was the biggest, one of the biggest problems. Did it take over life. your life as well? Yeah, completely. So from, I started, I drank when I was a kid, like everybody did. So yeah. You'd run out, you know, a little bottle of cider or whatever, stuff like that. But once I got to 15, I started drinking properly at the age of 15 then. Um, and it just snowballed. By the age of 16, I started snorting cocaine. 16? 16 was my first line. And I remember I was on the high street. How did you even have access to it then? Did you know people? Just like I was just on a night out. I was, a, I was an engineer back then. I was only a young kid. Like I, I wasn't even an apprentice or whatever he was then. And um, I was on the high street and I was blasted because I only drank at that point. And one of the lads was in the toilet and he went, yeah, just with a key, with a bar, that much lemon on it. I went, just have that. And I was total anti-drugs at that point, and I just went, whoa, and that was it. I was like, for the rest of the night, <laughs> I loved everybody, and yeah. the feeling that I got from it was incredible. I slept for about two days after it, I've never felt so dead in my life. And that was all I had, that one tiny little key. But the feeling of it was just like incredible. And yeah. I also felt like I understood what I was doing on the night, like, because I quite often black out and fight, mm. and stuff like that, but when there was snoring, I wasn't, fighting anymore. Yeah. Well it's a lot of, a lot of problems in it when obviously when you see fights in town you always realise that cocaine was behind a lot of it. People are on cocaine your confidence is increased drastically. Yeah, People yeah. talk to birds it's a lot easier and stuff like that don't they? But for yourself I'm assuming that's what happened to you and then just watch kind of get hooked on the, yeah, the field. I mean, thing, it, it? Literally it went from you know like the usual where people used to say oh let's get 320 bags or 3 for 50 or whatever. By the age of 18 I was working in the civil service then and I, um, I had a calendar on my desk and I, I already knew at like, the age of 18 that it was becoming a problem and I used to put like a little marker of the days when I'd snorted and drank and wow. I remember getting to the end of one year and it was the calendar was almost all fluorescent orange, I was just doing it. Daily? And daily at the end. I was um, so, so did you need alcohol to have it or was it getting to the point where you had it without alcohol? At that point when I was young it was always alcohol driven, it was always like, because you go out after work and have a pint or whatever. But, I said I tended to snort a lot. I wouldn't say seven days a week. That would be a lie. I was saying that, but it was. You, you're looking at a good at least three or four days a week. So more than half the week, you yeah. used to have a little go. I had the money as well, by the way. On well, that. back then it was only like twenty quid a year. Yeah, and then so from, from, from sixteen when you first started, eighteen was when you recognised it was an issue. So yeah. from eighteen to twenty six, that's a bad eight years, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I started working on the doors when I was twenty one, and then it was just. Like it was ready, it was easily available then. I could, yeah. I could just get it whenever I wanted. Yeah, I'm yeah. not blaming the doors for it because it was but my choice. You didn't have a bar with the one, you didn't have yeah. a bar with where right. you surround by it all the time. You kicked yeah. people off because they're doing it. And I just probably kicked off them. <laughs> yeah, and then have it. There was one night, I won't say what, but it was a big club in, in town. And um, I, I had an eighth of cocaine on me. I'd already had an eighth before I got into work. So this was a massive nightclub in town, this. And, um, People started dropping, everyone was like collapsing because it was like, um, I think it was a bad dog, so cat was going round and the ambulances and everyone was rushing to take people in. Next thing, there was riot fans, police, dogs, everything turns up. But oh as the, cl- the floor cleared, there was just 
pills and bags everywhere. And I'm like that around a bend. <laughs> picking all these up off. I filled my pockets with all kinds. And it, it was my cousin who worked with me at the time. I was like, you fucking messing. Get rid of all that. So I had to throw it all away. Yeah, yeah. I still managed to go. And I had an eighth on me at that point. So I thought, it's a that me. as well. Shite, I knew it was mine. So I ran upstairs and just nailed it in one hit. Just put it out. Gosh. And just snorted and snorted it. And then I had to sit. With all, with all the ultimate paranoia. Horrible. And then yeah. walk out. So it was past about 100 police officers and that was just hell. So that was 26 and is, it, is this towards the end, is this when you start thinking yeah. like what's going on here? So I'd, I'd, I'd probably tried a few times at that point to get clean and sober. I so did you have a few goals to the, yeah, what, the yeah, AA yeah. Yeah, and the I'd, CA? Yeah, there's a few times I'd say, I used to actually, when you start, you get what you call a newcomer's key ring. So every time you go to your first, you meet and order, after a relapse you get a white key ring. I had about 50 of them to the point where I had to go and give them back because they'd run out. That's how many times, I just kept Jesus. relapsing all the time. I wanted to, but I don't think the fight, I hadn't given up the fight properly at that point. So it took until my last time of snorting. Um, so it was, yeah, I was, must have been 27 at that point. And how old are you now? 37. 10 years now. Yeah. So I was in work, in town, on the doors. At the end of every night, everybody has one little baby and then gets off home. But I'd, I'd run out of money, so I'd got it. A loads of coke to sell so i had 18 grams on me to sell yeah. to try and make money slaughtered everyone got to the bar and one of the girls behind the bar when i asked for the drink i said give us a sambuca what the fuck but sambuca everybody else is having a little pint or something and she just said to me you're a fucking disgrace you did she and um, that was it snap bam. so at that point you just snorted all 18 grams yeah. which you could have sell to try and make a bit of money yeah and then you asked for the sambuca yeah <laughs> Just to try and so, like make me feel better because I was gonna have to drive home from work after snorting that much. Jesus, and, uh, and obviously, even things like that, the fact that you got to drive home and think at that moment you have no care about consequences in the car as well. So, you've yeah. probably done it multiple times to the point where yeah. you felt confident. Honest, yeah, like you do worry and you do care, but like you are not in a fit state. To no, drive you're not in control that. whatsoever. Then you're fucking terrifying. I can imagine. I can but imagine. The next day after that, um, I went to a meeting. Uh, so these cocaine anonymous and alcoholics anonymous you tend to be if you go to an a, a, a alcoholics anonymous they don't really like you to talk about cocaine in there it's just alcohol. ca they will accept everybody no matter what you're thinking as you said before though alcohol is the foundation of cocaine though isn't it for me it was I mean? but so in the end i was dry snorting for probably the last year i wouldn't even have to have a bevy i just snort and snort for all the time um, and if I had a bevy, I'd have probably, I'd have definitely snorted before that pint touched my lips. I'd have definitely nailed a lot of them up before it. Jesus and, um, Christ! But that was that, that, that's that a, one that's day. A mad state that in it to be yeah, like mentally. Like, how did you feel about yourself? Do you obviously you recognise what the issue? But was it was every single day a battle? Yeah. Mentally, you just you'd feel sick for what you've done for everybody else. And when you say to somebody, "Listen, I'm sorry I've done this," i.e., your wife or your mum and dad. And you're apologising to them. You, I guarantee, most addicts really mean what they say when they say, "I'll never do that again," because at that point you do mean I'll never do it again. But that little switch is there, and it just bumped the the, the disease of addiction takes over every, and it was always winning. Mm. The only thing that got rid of it for me was going to CA. So I went on that next Monday. I went to a meeting not far from here on Rodney Street, at a place called Sharp. And they've seen me there, they'd seen me there a million times. I disappeared for months, come back, and he's always welcomed me with open arms again. And they were there straight away, welcomed me. This time I got a sponsor straight away, and I started the 12 step program. And honest to God, I never ever looked back since, to the point where my last year working on the doors, I was clean and sober. And it was boss. And you were surrounded by it as well, temptation yeah. every single night. Dead easy. It was totally the obsession was gone. That's mad. So the 12 step then? Yeah. So obviously there's going to be people watching this now thinking, right, I was away, I, I need help. Yeah. What was the 12 steps? Like, I'm not going to be able to reel these off. No, 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 but I never thought, thought, I couldn't even imagine. Like, I mean, I, I'm assuming, I've never been to any, any means, of course, like, well, I'm assuming it's like obviously people surrounded each often, I suppose, and stuff like that, but to find out there's actually a step-by-step -step process. Yeah, yeah. So it's like what you see on the telly, you're all sitting around and you'll say, like, I, I am John, I'm an addict, and you're all, hi John. And at the end, everybody gives you a hug and that. But your 12 steps is the, your first step is admitting that you are powerless to alcohol and cocaine okay. or whatever drug of choice it is that you've got. 
And it, people get a bit freaked out because they do mention the word God in there, but that's just as a word they specifically say. That's just an easy word to use. But you, the idea is you've got a higher, somebody like a higher power, somebody who's more powerful than you. So your ego is up here when you're an addict, but you've got to give in to that. Yeah, like, yeah. Listen to somebody else. So I quite often used, um, I would think of my higher power as my auntie who passed away, or when my mate passed away, that he's my higher power now. Um, so the first part of it is accepting that you are powerless to drink and drugs. And then as the steps go on, one of them you have to make amends to people. So you go down, you write a list of everybody that you've caused harm to in your lifetime. And then you are then to go and make amends or with, uh, within your drink and drug lifetime. So you've got and to then, make amends in terms yeah. of what, go and speak to them. If apologize. it's not going to cause them any more harm. So you wouldn't want to go to like your expert who's now married with six kids because that could cause problems relevant. with her and her husband. Yeah, yeah. So you would leave stuff like that. But in your mind, you wrote it down and you get rid of that. and You forgive yourself kind of thing. So you'd have to go out to all these people and apologise and literally be willing to do anything. Some people might just say, I'm not asked, I'll never forgive you. That's fine, that's their well, choice. Well, you're better in your head, you've got that clarity. Yeah, I've tried to make amends to, for what I've done, but it was weird sitting down with like my mum and my dad, my wife's mum and, mum and dad. It's, she was have to speak to my sister, I can't remember. But my brother, my sister, my wife, and apologise to all these people. Even people who I worked with in, in, ta- in, the, in the office and stuff. Quite often people were in tears by the end of it. Yeah. Um, and I'll skip over a dead quick bit, but I, do, I had to do an amends to a police officer, which I've spoken about plenty of times about this, but it was, I'd got into a fight years and years and years before when I was younger, and I was in court for 12 months over it, and I was in the wrong, but I denied it the whole time. I was like adamant, I'm yeah, not getting Because yeah. it was jail time, because I'd got the police officer and slammed him in the car door. <laughs> but I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I didn't do that. That's a lie. Yeah. But it went on for that long. The judge just went, you know what, you're free to go, John. That's it. And I was like, yes. But then when I'd done these steps, I realised like, I was dragging him through court for 12 months. What was his family thinking? Is he going to lose his job? for? Because I blamed him for battering me, which yeah. he laid into me, but rightly so after what I've done. So anyway, I uh, was working on the doors at the time when I'd done my amends and I wrote a letter. And we have licensing police who come round on the doors to make sure everything's all right. And I spoke to the licensing police, I'm like, listen, I need to own up to what I've done here. And they were like, fuck off, what? So I wrote a letter, give it to them. They took it to the officer, because I remembered his name and his number at the time. And a few weeks later, they just come back and just went, you're all right. And give me the nod to say like, He's accepted. Your wow, knowledge. what's sound? But obviously that makes you feel so much better in your it head is, as well. Yeah, it? it's like, it's because I, I knew I was in the wrong. So that's why now, like to this day, like, I'm not perfect. I'll do things and I'm wrong and I'm like, bastard. <laughs> but there you've got to put... I'm and wrong exactly, and I put it. my hands up every time. Or even if the other person has done something which they should be in the wrong for, now yeah. I've got the mentality where... As long as if I know I've done wrong, then I'll admit my wrong doing. And from that point of view, though, it's like whatever the issue is, it's squashed very quickly yeah. rather than being dragged out for 12 months yeah. when it doesn't need to yeah. and affecting a lot of other people along the way yeah. from a non selfish point of view now. Yeah. So that's brilliant. That's unbelievable. Like, that's, a, that's an unbelievable story. And I did not know that about yourself, obviously, when we first started. But then talk to me now about your tools yeah. that you use to keep yourself motivated because I know for a fact that when you've been an addict for that long am I right in saying just something that's got to keep you occupied yes million or that for me yeah little bastard John in the back of your head <laughs> is going to come digging its way back through yeah. and not win again but it reminds you about saying things so yeah. you've got to keep yourself occupied haven't you so obviously I try to practice the 12 steps as much as I can, as I can. And I try to keep in that mindset. And if you keep in that mindset, you shouldn't really relapse as long as you're doing the things that are suggested within the 12 steps. But imagine how many years I had focused on drink and drugs and not focused on anything else. Like that was my life. So my new life now is open and there's all this time in the world for me to do stuff. So I needed to fill it with something. I'd always enjoyed training. But I was always in and out of it because if I was on a bender, you're not going to see me train for the next three months. Yeah, yeah. I once nailed an eighth and went training in David Lloyd's once. No that way. Thing. That didn't last long. <laughs> um, Damn, your heart rate would have been through the roof. Fight. This was just so I didn't get to see my wife. Like, well, she was my girlfriend at the time. But as soon as you don't want press up, me. sure, that heart rate was going, John. I remember getting a chest press. I got on a chest press and I was like, 
Oh, wow, get out and just sit in the cave outside for hours. Um, damn. So training was always a big thing for me. Art, I hadn't touched art since I'd left school. So from the age of 15. Well, you're good in school though. Yeah. You must be really good in school. I've school. School. got an A in school. It's a natural talent, but you've got now though. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's really just, impressive. I've grinded at it and I've just crafted it more yeah. and more. So, um, so yeah, so it became for me, it was all about me training and my artwork. And now it's like I mentioned earlier, my wife will say, that she'll see the difference in my behavior or mood. If I haven't trained for a few days, mm. or if I haven't painted for a couple of days, which get a lot more snappier. Yeah, I'm just more miserable. I'm not. I don't. I used to be snappy. I'm not a snappy anymore. But I just tend to go into myself. Yeah. And I'll yeah. just sit, and I won't speak. And sometimes you prefer somebody who would actually argue with you than be a mute. Yeah. Because that's you, like what have I done wrong kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I will withdraw into myself quite a bit if I haven't painted and if I haven't trained. And I noticed. So last week I trained. I didn't follow the programme properly because I'd done all my sessions in about four days when it was meant to be, I think it was over the full yeah, week. it was like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, I come to Tuesday, you're all done. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so damn, had, this like, man's on a mission today. I had a four day break from training and I noticed on the Sunday how miserable I was. I even, when you messaged me, I said I'm in a bad place here at the minute. Yeah. And it was because, I, the way I, I hadn't trained for a few days I and mean, my whole mindset just crumbled on me. It's Man, it's very sensitive, yeah. isn't it? It's very, very sensitive, isn't it? But the training side of things, like I say, was a, it gave you, I think for you, it gave you a purpose, it gave you a drive. Like the training side of things, you've got, always got a goal to aim yeah. towards when it comes to training. Like you've got obviously you've got your physical aspect, you know what you're capable of, but you've also got your strength goals as well. Yeah. And having that mindset to where it occupies you, it occupies you to the point where you think, right, I've got to go in today, I've got to go and do this, this, and this, and this. Yeah. And having that in your head on a day to day basis, keeps your mind entertained Massively. in the right purposes. Yeah, and it's, it's like uh, I can take me addiction over into me training and especially like the way you do the progressive overload stuff, I love all of that yeah. because I might do something where last week I might have lifted just 60 kilos for something then I go in and I see that 60 kilos I'm like I'm not leaving this gym today unless I beat that yeah. or if it's reps wise I'm like I'll do more reps yeah. than that and it, Increase the volume. Yeah, it feels great because I, I knew it's something else for me to chase and focus yeah. on. And for you to go in and lift that little tiny bit more, you've got to have a lot of aspects in your life to be in order. Like you've got to have had a decent sleep the night before. Yeah. Your nutrition's got to be on point. Yeah. You've got to have sufficient rest in that specific body part. But it's quite funny. I know there's people watching this thinking, Phil, staying in. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what they're going to be watching. They're going to think, Am I getting this right? <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting this right here? What is going on? But yeah, it is true. He's actually my client. I'm not, I'm not. I have had coaches in the past, and I wouldn't say anything bad about them coaches, but they just couldn't. What's my wife say? I'm unmanageable. That's <laughs> what she will say. And you're probably you're the only one who's done the coaching for me who has managed to work around my weird behaviours and yeah, but I, I'm I up think or when I'm down and stuff like that. I just know what you're like now and it sounds a bit strange. If like you miss a couple of days, I know what's going on. Yeah. Immediately. Or even the time during lockdown when you had a you had a month where you went psychotic yeah. and because yeah. you couldn't have access to all these heavy weights because obviously the gym's closed down was a massive destruction to a lot of people because yeah. we need the heavy weights not to get big, get massive, but it's our switch off. Yeah. It's our feeling of satisfaction to throw 120 kilos above your head. Where, and then you only come in, I think, like three or four times. Yeah. We've done some outside sessions. They were fantastic, they were brilliant sessions, a few different type of exercises, a little bit different. The weather was out, we had the music on outside, we had the barbells, plates, and that sense of just like for one hour of doing what we've done was a, just a big game changer in your it head. It got me through that, like that four weeks. It filled yeah, and it was only like maybe one session a week yeah. as well, but it still was enough to get you through and give you a purpose and give you the drive, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It was like, because sometimes like my artwork can't save me all the time. Training is probably that's the biggest thing that I miss. So throughout all this lockdown stuff that happens, I could paint every single day. Yeah. So it's like, and it, it was boss. I was like, yes. But the two come together for me without what, without training, I crumbled. Yeah. And that, then that four week one was it about four four? It was the last lockdown was yeah, wasn't as long think, as all the others was no, it? No, I think it was would have been. We went to lockdown the fourth of January and we come out the twelfth of April. So it was a four week spell within there. That I was think the worst found, one for me. Yeah, because it like was just terrific. it was like what the hell's going on? When is the fa- when is the finishing point? Yeah. Like obviously, fucking fat Bojo shut the gyms down, didn't he? But then didn't really isn't 
didn't realize the damages of people's mental health. Like it, there was no care whatsoever no. behind that. Like there was, it was proven as well that COVID is positively affected by people who, who are healthy. So if you're healthy, sorry, if you're healthy, COVID will not be as damaging to yeah. you. Massively. So we were close to gyms. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. We'll get fifty percent McDonald's. It doesn't make sense. Everything they've done didn't make sense. There's still all. nobody at this point trying to push like vitamin. So it was like when the gym is there, that's when I can just get all of that. Like not anger. It's not always anger. It is anger. It's like, it probably like, is though. It's, it's, it's that that hyperactive inside. And I'm a dead hype, and I want to just get rid of all this energy. Yeah. And I there do you that go. when I'm training. Yeah. I thought you're, you're putting your and at the minute. Christ on a bike. That was, that's like something I'd be half of would have said that. Christ on a bike. Christ on a bike at all, though. I'm not going to comment on that. Christ. I don't know where you're going um, My stent's flying at the minute. Mm, you're just saying that because I'm injured. Well. well not the size of the arms, by the way. So I'm just going to inform people before people think <laughs> I need to justify. It looks more. Dude, Josh, shut up. Do you know what I mean? If you do. So I end up doing my elbow tendon and I've done weights for 12 years. 12 years. My elbow tendon went four weeks ago, which is the tricep under there. So the tricep affects anything push. So any, I can't do a press up, can't do any overhead press, can't even extend my arm properly up there. So when that happened, it was devastating, absolutely devastating. But I've lost 16 pounds so far. And I think 15 pounds is in the right bicep and the tricep, just in the arm alone. But it doesn't look too, it doesn't look too bad, but it's, it's so hard mentally to accept yeah. with everything that's going on. Because like I said, don't wait for years. I done a 155 kilo bench press a week before my elbow tendon went, and I went, Boxing popped on me, boxing and just got boxing a bit. my shoulders went. Oh, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Mm. Ridiculous, just stick to weights from now on. But that, that's it. But for yourself, though, your strength progressed massively, yeah, it's as of late. So, one of the other things was like, so in when we were in that lockdown and you took me outside the gym and we were doing some training, like I couldn't do a bench dip because the pain that I thought was in the rotator cuff, yeah, yeah. which within seconds you were like, I think that's just your chest tight, tight. yeah. So, you give me some exercises to do. The bench dips was just like stretching everything for me. I never haven't been able to bench for years because the pain that I was always getting in my shoulders, it was put overhead press, mm. but I couldn't bench press. Yeah. And then just from those exercises that you gave me to do and the stretches, I'm now benching. It's it weird. Is. And it's like And all we done was just open up something so small and yeah. just to And it all it was like within that one session I felt it loosen up loads. And I do that every single session now. I'll always do all my shoulder work, uh, yeah. stretches to my chest and my shoulders. Yeah. I even get the ball and get that pushed into yeah. my chest. Or get the, get the pole over your head, back yeah. and forth, or, or a band. And it's just, it opens up everything, like to the point where yesterday I'd done um, 50, 57.5 kilo dumbbells, and I was just a nice set of five with them yesterday. You're making me jealous here, like. It was just dead weird. I've never ever done that before. Yeah. And I, I go back to like, when I was 19 and a half stone, full of testosterone. Testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> Where I'm not now. Yeah. Um, and I could never have lifted that back then. Yeah. But, but now, yeah. but just doing things properly you now. Yeah. Doing things, obviously, the natural way, we are obviously the foods in place. But like I say, that keeps your mind, keep that focused on it. So we will sum it up anyway. And I want your advice for anyone struggling because it, it it's rife in our city yeah. right now and i've got a lot of clients who eventually similar to yourself open up yeah. about problems yours was a past problem but i've yeah. got clients now who are very present yeah. in their problems so for me I'll, i don't know i'll even look at the camera for this is i get a lot of people coming to me asking for help um, and what i would say would be to open up to family members mm -hmm. before anybody else because if you can make yourself accountable you're less likely to be able, well, you'll, if, you're, if you're an addict, you'll always be able to sneak out and do what you want to do. But I find that opening up to close family members is the most powerful part of it all. Um, people and, care about you, yeah. I'm assuming. And like, go on, you know, a lot of people find it, go on social media. I found this recently, people go on social media, say I need help, and they get loads of help. Then they might relapse, and then people are like, ah, it's all right, mate, it's just one berry, it's just one line. It's not, because... You, you can have a million relapses in you, but you might only ever have one recovery. Yeah. So my point on that is, be careful with who you're taking advice off via like social media and stuff. Um, but if you're struggling, I just say reach out. The first thing, the best thing that you can do is admit that you've got a problem to somebody. Um, it goes from there. For me, personally, I went to Sharp on Rodney Street for a CA meeting, Cocaine Anonymous. These meetings all over the world. You can even go on holiday. 
And I know people who go on holiday and the first thing they do is look to see where the next meeting is so that they don't miss a meeting while away. Things like that. Yeah, so you can't get away with it. It's there if you want to do it. Even if you have to travel 10, 50 miles for it, if you want to get clean and sober, you'll do whatever you can possible. Yeah. If that means taking a bus that'll take you four hours to get there, then you've got to do that. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. But I will say, it's not as hard as people think. Um, of course. That's what probably people really, really need to hear because yeah. obviously people think, <clears throat> but I think people stuck with their own battles constantly all the time. And as you said, they're talking on social media. It's, it's a virtual message from people who are probably not as close to you as what you probably like to think. Yeah. Like people message it all the time, think I haven't seen them for two years. Yeah. Where it's, if you go up and open up to a family member who probably cared about you a lot more, yeah. and that, you know, that talking effect and the fact that you did in front of you. To be honest with you, and you need brutal honesty. Yeah. And that was one of the main things for me. No one was honest with me while I was around the bench until it was me mate Mel who said you're a fucking disgrace and that was me ego was smashed to pieces yeah. off that one so and then talk about how training is a positive thing as well then it, Which just, it, it, it is in many aspects but yeah it gives you something to focus on it give, it lets you release a lot of tension um, energy as well like I think being a, a cocaine addict having being full of energy it's going to go somewhere yeah it quite has. often it would go there um, so Training would be, I think, it's, a, it's not going to get you clean and sober. I don't think. I think you you will get that from the program. Yeah. But your training side of things, you're just going to improve your whole health. Your mental health will improve. A massive issue is for people who will use is mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So training is like you know it releases the endorphins, does yeah. all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Usually, and obviously, you feel better about yourself. You start yeah. to look good. You, you give yourself a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement. Yeah. You start praising yourself. Do you know what? I've been to the gym three times this week. Fan, fucking fantastic. Yeah. So I suppose that all works. But hey, John, unbelievable. Thank you so 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 much for coming. Thank you for being so honest as well about it all. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. And guys, hopefully you probably enjoyed that show. But it was uh, an absolute pleasure to have you on board. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you.